The automobile is one of the most important inventions that revolutionized the modern world in America. The rich history of car culture runs deep as technology continues to shape the future of the industry. Jason Stein, former publisher of Automotive News, is here to share the stories of people passionate about cars, from industry leaders and innovators to car-obsessed celebrities. Buckle up as Jason takes you inside the boardroom, onto the track, and around the bend on Cars and Culture on Sirius XM Business Radio. Hi, I'm Jason Stein, host of Cars and Culture. Before we get to this week's interview, I want to say that this episode is brought to you by Connected by Reynolds & Reynolds. I love the conversations I get to have on this show because they're exactly that. They're conversations. Another podcast I found worth checking out for conversations is Connected by Reynolds & Reynolds. Greg Ulan goes deep with guests on everything from used car acquisitions to finding your niche and selling to it. I definitely recommend adding Connected to your rotation. Welcome to Carson Culture on Sirius XM and episode 117. I'm your host, Jason Stein. She is the woman with the iconic name and equally more remarkable story, McLaren. The word is as storied as her father's history. Around the perfectly manicured grass fields of Pebble Beach, California, or at the brand's futuristic headquarters in Southern England, the name says it all. It has an energy to it, a culture, a feeling. Amanda McLaren lives the history because she is the only pathway to the past. She was so young when her father, Bruce, died tragically, crashing his Can-Am car on the Levant Strait just before Woodcott Corner at Goodwood Circuit in England. It was June 2nd, 1970. He was just 32. His daughter was only four. What Bruce McLaren left behind was a legacy of technology, innovation, hard work, and racing excellence. And today, Amanda McLaren continues the tradition of telling her father's story, both as a brand ambassador and the head of her father's trust. On McLaren's 60th anniversary this year and a dozen years as a car company, the story is a good one to tell. McLaren continues to make waves in the automotive market as well as on the track, which is what Bruce would have wanted. Its vehicle expansion has been remarkable, a level of diversification unseen for such a young company. And on the track, it's contending against players with larger budgets and longer histories. What's most unique, McLaren started as a race company that became a car company. Every other brand does it the other way around. She tells the story well, and hers is just as interesting. Today, during a conversation at the historic Pebble Beach Concours, she talks about growing up in New Zealand, her pathway after her father's death, and her commitment to ensure his legacy lives on at full throttle. From the Quail Lodge near Pebble Beach, where the brand was honored for its 60 years, it's Amanda McLaren. Hi, I'm Amanda McLaren, and this is Cars and Culture with Jason Stein. It's another year at Pebble Beach, but it's the first time that you and I are sitting here together. What a pleasure, Amanda, to, to be with you and to be with a McLaren at the Monterey Peninsula for another year. Welcome well, in. Thank you so much. It's fantastic to be here. What a marvelous event. How many times have you been to Pebble Beach? So I've been to Pebble Beach, I think, three times, okay. um, but this is actually my first time at Quail. And a little bit different in that I'm kind of with the owners this time rather than hosting as a part of my job working for McLaren Automotive previously. So just seeing another side of, of the event, which has been great. This event, we talked with Michael Leiters a year ago about this. It has a cultural significance and a cultural richness to it that you can really feel when you're walking around here. What do you take from a cultural perspective of this event? It, it, it's the energy. You've got everybody here who's just so passionate about cars. And maybe not everybody about McLaren, but it, it, it's just a great feeling. It, it really is. So, yeah, great event. The following that McLaren has here in the United States. Mm -hmm. I, I know that you, you spend some time in the U.S., but most of your time overseas. What's the feeling that you get from, from the passion that's around the McLaren brand? Well, I mean, it's great. The, the U.S. Is, is our main market in terms of McLaren Automotive. Um, America is kind of picking up on how exciting and how great Formula One is as well. So we've got some races back here again. But I really kind of blame it on the Can-Am series. <laughs> back in the 60s, um, my dad and his co-driver, Denny Holm, dominated the Can-Am series, um, Group 7 sports cars across America and Canada, hence the name. And they won five championships in a row and 1969 won all 11 of the 11 races. 
So you still got people in America that, that remember those days and seeing those huge orange cars dominate. So I think that's kind of filtered through and, and we've heard a lot of people sort of saying they've told their sons and then their grandsons about those heydays of motor racing. So I think that the McLaren name has, has always sort of had a bit of a foothold in the States. Um, and now with the brand, of course, with the current team and, and road cars, even more so, which is just fabulous. Yeah, you had one of those uh, loud, uh, obnoxious uh, <laughs> engines fired up earlier here today. Michael Leiter says it's music, and he's just so right. He is right. He is right, isn't he's he? So but that, right. but that does really bring people back to the to the passion of the brand, doesn't it? it when when you hear those engines fire, the Can Am series. Absolutely. I mean, they, they are just about the loudest car on the planet, and. <laughs> They make the most amazing noise, and every year back at McLaren headquarters, they have a minute's noise um, with the car. And as a tribute to Dad, way better than a minute's silence. It's just so fitting. But funny enough, the first year that they did it, they started up the car inside in MTC, and it blew the lights out of the roof oh. in the workshop where it was, because <laughs> it was so loud. Um, so yeah, we were so lucky to hear it, have it here today, and hear it far up before the press. Um, press release, so yeah, all good. And you had some other Formula One cars positioned behind as well. So yes, that they've got a lineup of, of historic cars um, from you know the early Formula One cars that Dad raced through to um, the Formula One car from last year. So it's great to see that here. Some people obviously know the rich history of McLaren in racing, and and of course know Formula One now. Mm -hmm. But the foundation of this brand, truly, as Michael Leiter's said to the crowd today is that you started as racers first. Yes. You didn't start as a car company first. We, we didn't. So, and, and as Michael so rightly said, that makes us quite different. Mm. So dad started the race team, um, Formula One, Formula Two, Formula 5000, Formula Libras, sports cars, Group 7, and then developing a Group 4 sports car. And it was about racing. But then he also wanted to do a road car. But what he did was take an M6 Can-Am car, mm. put a roof on it and make it road legal, which was his prototype road car, his daily driver. And unfortunately, after he was killed, that project was shelved. Move forward to today, we are taking that same DNA, the same lightweight philosophy, using lightweight materials and creating cars that just handle so beautifully and are so much fun and so engaging to drive because they're based on a lightweight race car. And lightweight is, is we're not just saying it, so dominating the Can-Am series, Dad was asked why his Can-Am cars were so much quicker than anyone else's and so dominant. And he said, it's because they're lighter than anyone else's. Hmm. So, you know, he'd look at those road cars today and he'd be thumbs up, absolutely approving. And yeah, the DNA that he started lives through to the company today. He's so far ahead of his time then, wasn't he? He really was. He was very much the innovator, the pioneer. And I think that that's quite a New Zealand thing, um, living completely the other side of the world. If you wanted to do anything, you had to create it yourself. Mm. So we've had a lot of very good designers and engineers come out of New Zealand. Um, and Dad wanted to experiment with new things to make the cars lighter and faster and quicker and to win. So we pioneered what was kind of the carbon fiber in the 60s, came from the aerospace industry, called Malite. And it was a sandwich of aluminium with balsa wood on each side. Exactly the same philosophy. Make it lighter, but make it more rigid. So the car doesn't flex, you can set it up, you can drive more quickly through the corners. A little bit like carbon fiber in the early days, very hard to, to engineer and to mold. So, you know, the first Formula One car that McLaren did with carbon fiber, five flat panels of carbon. We've moved on so far, but because we pioneered that, you know, we are seen as world leaders, but it all started back with kind of dad pushing the envelope, trying new things, being the first to cut nostrils in his car mm. to create the downforce, which, you know, have translated across to race cars today and to road cars. So, you know, the beautiful P1 has those nostrils in her nose. That was all because of dad kind of putting two and two together and thinking, yeah, I'm going to do this. And it all works so well. Let's talk a little bit about him. He was always an engineer at heart, wasn't he? I mean, a racer, of course, 
but also an engineer and a different type of mind. Did he know that he was going to get into automotive? Or, was, or could it have been aerospace? Originally, or? Well, originally not. He, he actually says in, in the autobiography he wrote that he wanted to be an all-black and play rugby for New Zealand. Oh. But then at the age of nine, he was diagnosed with Perthes disease, which is a degenerative condition of the hip joint, and was in traction for two years on a frame, never came off it, and was at one point told he may never walk again. He did walk, albeit with quite a pronounced limp for a while there, but he was told no more contact sports, so that put an end to rugby. His father, my grandfather, um, owned a service station, but part of the work of the service station was to look after race cars. And so that's how my father met Jack Brabham, because Jack would bring his cars over from Australia and pop grandfather would look after them. So dad grew up kind of in an automotive industry or a race car industry. My grandfather had raced motorbikes until he had children and then Nana, his wife, my grandmother, dad's mum, said bikes are too dangerous so he started racing cars instead. It always happens that which way. Which I'm not sure quite how <laughs> uh, safe, much safer cars were back in those days. But dad kind of grew up around cars as well and he says again in that autobiography, um, he was always upsetting the foreman at the garage because he was taking a spanner and trying to undo his little toy mm. cars and things like that. So at the age of 13, the little Austin, which is now pride of place mm -hmm. in the boulevard at McLaren Technology Center in England, that came in literally kind of on the end of a tow rope and dad looked at it apparently and said, that's never gonna be a race car. Mm. But he worked on it over a couple of years, persuaded his, his father to let him race it and was subsequently very successful, but was always changing the car. He says he, he never raced it in the same setup twice because he was always tweaking it to make it go faster. So very much an engineer, um, did engineering, um, started doing a degree at what is now um, the University of Auckland, but actually never finished the degree because he won the Driver's Europe Scholarship apparently promised his parents that he would go back and do his final year, but didn't. Hmm. So, um, yeah, a car designer, a car engineer, a car driver, a test driver, ended up running the, the, the team as well. So, you know, team boss, um, but very much one of the team. And I think uh, to do all those things and achieve what he did in short period of time a very short period yeah. of time especially from just going to the uk at the age of, of 20 through to his death at the age of 32 12 years yeah and a That's miraculous level of achievement amazing during those dozen years yeah and your mother was very much into racing too wasn't she she was so she loved racing even before she met dad so she was from christchurch in in new zealand as well and used to race go-karts when, when she was a teenager. But she and dad met at a party in Timaru, um, a little south of Christchurch where she was born. And they got together and she became very much a support to the team. The wives and the girlfriends back mm. in those days did all the lap scoring and timekeeping and also made sure that you know the drivers had their overalls and crash helmets and that the mechanics got a cup of tea and some lunch. Um, and even after dad died, all her girlfriends were the wives and husbands of, 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 of the wives and, and girlfriends of the racing drivers. And until the day she died, she was McLaren's number one fan. Hmm. And she called everybody who worked there, no matter how long or short a time they'd been there, her boys. Hmm. So yeah, she was a huge fan and, and a huge support to the team. And even after your father died, she still wanted to continue, she did continue, going to racetracks. And you spent a lot of time in and around motor racing when you were a child. So, mum absolutely continued to go to the, the circuits and, and support dad. Um, and even after he died, she would always go to Silverstone um, and then usually one European Grand Prix a year. And if she was in America seeing friends, she'd go to um, events over here. I didn't go to the races so much as a little girl. Um, 
I think back then it was probably quite a dangerous environment for a young child to be getting in the way and getting under the wheels of the cars because there weren't some kind of the, the fences and the designated areas mm -hmm. and, and the, the barriers. So um, I went more probably to the factory and I've got a few pictures of me sort of in the factory peering at cars and in some of dad's cars and especially his, his prototype road car. Um, but as I grew up, I'd always go to Silverstone with mum and after I moved to New Zealand, I'd go back on holiday and then the Goodwood Festival and Revival was happening. So if I was in England at that point, I'd go. But um, yeah, it was an interesting kind of place and family to grow up in. Um, and for a long time, I didn't kind of make the connection as to what it was my father had done. Who he was. So, or who he was, and who all these friends coming round were. And that, you know, Uncle Jackie was actually Jackie Stewart. And Uncle, Uncle Graham. Graham was Graham Hill. And, and so, yeah, it was a gradual realization. Yeah, right. absolutely. And James Hunt. Ja you told a great story of when you were 10 years old at the British Grand Prix. Yes. And at that time, in the mid-1970s, sort of everybody had James Hunt on their wall, whether you were a girl or a boy, uh, that, that, for various reasons. <laughs> absolutely, he he and, was he was gorgeous. I mean, he was a pin-up boy, but he also drove Formula One cars. And so, I go back to school on the Monday morning, having been to the British Grand Prix in 1976, and I'm at an all-girls school, and all my ten-year-old classmates have sort of got James on on their wall as well. And most of them didn't know the connection. They didn't know my surname. We were just sort of Julia and Jane and Sarah and Susan and Amanda. And so they said, oh, what did you do over the weekend, Amanda? And I said, well, I met James Hunt. And there was this complete silence in the room. And suddenly Can you still I see their mouths open at that point? Their mouths are open, their <laughs> eyes are out and stalks. And I'm like, oh, I think I've said something kind of important here. And they started asking me all these questions. How did you end up next to James Hunt? Would be How the first did question. you meet James? <laughs> and I sort of drew myself up very proudly and I said, he drives for the Formula One team that my father founded. Hmm. And then they started asking me more questions and I realized I knew no answers. So I went back home and mum used to get Road and Track and other motor racing magazines and I started looking at them and seeing names that were familiar to me because I realized they came around to our house. And they were on the spines of the book collection that mum had upstairs. So I started reading and I started asking questions and I started cutting pictures out of the, the, the magazines and things. And that was really the light bulb moment for me at 10 years old that, um, yeah, Uncle Graham was kind of triple crown winner and, and Formula One world champion and he wasn't just a family friend, he was a big hero to people. And, and, and then I started realizing what my dad had done. And I mean, even now, you know, his podium rate through can -Nam was almost equal to Michael Schumacher's in Formula One. Mm. And that's phenomenal, mm. you know, in, in, in a five year period. So yeah, yeah, it was, I'm glad that happened. I'm glad James kind of drove from McLaren and created that event, because I don't know how long it would have taken otherwise. Because um, mum didn't really talk too much about it. Yeah, there were a few little trophies around, but I thought everybody's dad did that. So. <laughs> your mother never blamed racing for your father's death. She was never, she had never had animosity about racing, right? No, no. She always said to me, your father died doing what he loved. Oh. So obviously it was a very traumatic time for her. Um, she lost a baby at the same time as she lost my father. But she continued to be McLaren's number one fan, loved motor racing. It had been her life. And so it continued to be her life, albeit a little bit different. Um, but she, yeah, a true racing fan. You don't really, you were four and a half when he crashed and died. Mm. You, you don't really, you've said you don't really have a strong memory of him, is that correct? I, that is correct. In some ways, I think it may be easier to lose a parent at a younger age than maybe if I'd been 14. Um, but what I am very lucky to have is the people that knew him and tell the stories of what an amazing guy he was. I've got the pictures, I've got the, the film footage, I've got the books, and we've still got racing and automotive. We're celebrating 60 years this year, yeah. 2023, with the second oldest Formula One team in the history of the sport, 
that red Italian one. Um, <laughs> I can't bring myself to say the F word. Um, it is the oldest, you know. What a fantastic legacy. And so for his daughter, and, and, and I'm his only child, to see that out there, his name's still going strong. Um, I'm really proud and really excited for him and also for everybody that's involved today, sort of still a part of it. And there's still so many people who say, I can't thank Bruce enough for what he's done to the sport and what he's done to um, cars in general, uh, to the industry. Y yes. Really. And, and that must be just moving to you. The fact that still today, 60 years later, that, that you're getting that kind of, um, that he's getting that kind of adulation that's transferred over to you. Absolutely. I mean, you, know, you said transferred to me. I, I'm just Bruce's daughter. It's had, I've got nothing to do with it. Mm. It was all my dad and what he did. However, the genetic dice roll, I'm so fortunate to be, a, <laughs> be born his daughter and be able to be a, be a part of all this because it's been such an exciting journey. Um, you know, racing continuing to do so well over the years. And we're back there at the front of the field now. And then automotive. And when I think of it, it really reflects dad's story in the, you know, he achieved what he did in the UK in 13 years. Automotive is now 13 years old. Yeah. And when you look at the product they've created over the 13 years, and three years having, after having established the company, we bring P1 to market yeah. and rival Porsche and Ferrari with that car. That was the most phenomenal achievement. And McLaren's always used the word achievement. Dad talked about life is measured in achievement, not in years alone. And we've continued to do exactly that over the years. So that's really exciting. And, and, and it's to see the excitement in people following racing and buying into the automotive brand, it's like, yeah, it's all bearing dad's name. He had an innate ability to inspire people, didn't he? He did, and that's a really interesting side of his character in that one of his original team members, a New Zealander called Howden Ganley, who then later became a very good family friend and actually married one of my mum's very, very good friends, um, said that when they were working for, for Bruce or with Bruce in the 60s, if he'd come into the factory in the morning and said, we're not going to build cars today, we're going to march out in, into the desert and build a brick wall, they would have said yes, Bruce, and they would have followed him <laughs> without question because, yes, he could inspire and could just get everybody to follow him. And so they're actually making a movie, and it's not going to be a documentary. It's going to be a, a not a Hollywood because we want to portray the characters accurately, um, <laughs> but it is going to be a full-length feature film with a dramatic arc exploring the character that was that person that could inspire. Hmm. And so we want to inspire people who maybe aren't into motor racing just to follow their passion and their dream. And also just appeal to the people who do want to see big orange Can-Am cars and Formula One cars and things. But it's really going to look at that side of dad's character and his ability just to inspire. When does that come out? So good question. We haven't got a timeline at the hmm. moment. Um, it's very much a work in progress at the moment, sorting out all, all the legal contracts and things um, sort of globally, which every country has different requirements. And a lot of work for the, for the production team at the moment. But hopefully in the near future, we'll get some actors engaged and, and they'll start filming because it's a really exciting project. I want to go back to that word, engaged. He had an ability to engage everyone. Interesting story that I didn't know, that everyone at McLaren came to work came into work the day after he was killed, despite having been told to take the day off. Absolutely. So after he was killed, one of the designers went back into to the factory and told everybody what had happened and said, you know, we appreciate you'll need some time off. Take tomorrow off as mark of respect to Bruce. One of the directors goes back into the factory the next morning, every single person is there working. And when asked why, the foreman stood up and said, Bruce wouldn't want us to take the day off. What was he here for? To build cars and win races. That's what we're going to continue to do for Bruce. So they rebuilt that M8D Can-Am car for Dan Gurney. Mm. Um, in less than two weeks, they had built it, got it to the States, and he goes and wins at Mossport, and Danny comes third, as a tribute to Dad. And, you know, that, that's the sort of 
mentality they had that yes it was a, a dreadful period for the team but they were going to continue on for Bruce and so they did and we're still here today marking 60, 60 and it years. still follows through the entire McLaren organization today that kind of feeling that kind of work ethic mm -hmm. again 60th year now 13th year working on cars but whether it's Zach Brown or Michael Leiters or anyone else in between on both sides of the house there's still that Bruce McLaren spirit, isn't there? Yes. And I've seen it at the MTC. I've, I've seen the, 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 the passion, the devotion, and the ethic behind all of it. That, that's right. I think, you know, when you're winning, in racing especially, it's great. But you work just as hard, if not harder, if you're not winning. Yeah. And if you're not passionate and you're not determined and you don't want to succeed, then perhaps it's not the job. Um, and we're so fortunate at McLaren that so many of the people are just 101% passionate about cars and racing and then taking that technology and, and, and developing the road cars. And you know, we were foremost a, a racing team, so it is about the racing. And then you know, working in the same building, building the road cars and just having that transfer. And it just it's a completely different feeling from walking into some other car manufacturer, some big OEM or, or even some of the smaller brands because you haven't got that connection and that synergy which creates that energy and that passion and it, it, it's a very unique brand but I think we're very lucky because of it. At the McLaren Technical Center one of the more interesting things that you showed me four years ago were, was the trophy case mm -hmm. and the fact that and it stretches from one end of the hall to the other with all of the trophies that have been collected but you ask the drivers, and I think it's even written, correct me if I'm wrong, into the contract of a driver, whether it's a, whether it was a, um, an Ayrton Senna, mm -hmm. the trophy goes into the trophy case. You might get a replica, but it goes into the trophy case. That, that's correct. So we have what is alleged to be the largest collection of privately owned sporting trophies in the world. And we've got Formula One trophies, we've got some of my dad's trophies there. Um, we've got trophies that some of the engineers and, and, and people involved with the development of the cars have won. Fastest pit crew tire change, they've got um, trophies there. Fastest pit crew river rafting down the road, they won that. We've now got the Formula E, the Extreme E, um, we've got IndyCar. But yes, if you drive a race car from McLaren, your contract says your trophy comes back here as well because it's a team effort. Wow. It's a team sport. And they, they've kind of moved where Formula One used to be, just across one of the workshops. But they're kind of right outside where that trophy cabinet is. And it reminds them kind of why they're there and why they're doing it. Because at the end of the day, it is about winning. And so, yeah, that trophy display is just phenomenal. It really is. Maybe and they're putting more trophies in there now. Which maybe is just Lando fantastic. can borrow one of the trophies and give it to Max Verstappen for <laughs> his efforts recently. <laughs> Before we get back to this interview, I want to say that this episode is brought to you by Connected by Reynolds & Reynolds. If you want to hear great conversations and Greg Eulen going deep with guests on everything from used car acquisitions to finding your niche and selling to it, I recommend adding Connected to your podcast rotation. Now let's get back to my interview. So let's talk a little bit about um, your role as a brand ambassador. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? What do you, how do you represent the brand? I think... It's, McLaren is quite unique in that they have access to the daughter of the founder. Mm -hmm. So for our fans and customers, me making the link between the history and the heritage and dad and the current product is, is something that's very special in that you go to Ferrari or Porsche or one of the other manufacturers, you're not going to get that access to the family. So I see that kind of as my role and telling the story of dad and making the link through to the current product. Um, and with racing, they're kind of following in dad's footsteps as well into breaking into the different genres of murder racing. And so again, sort of history continues. So it's a wonderful role. Um, when I get asked, what does a brand ambassador do? The answer really is anything they want me to do. <laughs> You spend a lot of time um, with customers, don't you? But it's so yes. Um, you go on a lot of rallies. You go on product introductions. Yes, which is fantastic because everyone's there because they love the brand. Right. But for us, and and 
it was never so much work. Mm -hmm. I used to say, you know, what a great job to do, to be paid to talk about your dad and to talk about the cars. But because the McLaren owners and, and people are so enthusiastic, they do a lot of events. Mm -hmm. So you start seeing old friends mm -hmm. who you've kind of made a, created a relationship with, and then you meet new ones. And, and make new friends, and that's a really lovely part of the job. Um, and I use the word job inverted, in inverted commas now, so um, myself and my husband Stephen, we're honorary brand ambassadors for racing and automotive, so we don't get paid. Mm. Um, but, you know, you don't retire from being Bruce's daughter. No. And, you know, he would just be so delighted with what's going on and what's happening that I just, and so excited to keep representing the company and, and, and keep, keep talking about dad and the product. and So yeah, it, it's, it's a great thing to do. The Bruce McLaren Trust. Hmm. Tell me a little bit about that. So the Bruce McLaren Trust is a non-profit organization based in New Zealand, set up in the early 90s with the aim to, sorry, the late 90s, with the aim to kind of perpetuate the history and the heritage and the legacy of, of, of Bruce and some other New Zealand drivers. Over the years, it, it was very successful initially and then it just began to sort of become a little dormant. Mm. And then through COVID, nothing was happening. My husband and I retired back to New Zealand in November 2021. And I put forward a proposal to the then three trustees that they retire from their positions. And myself and some friends, we take over as trustees which we have done. We have changed the aims and objectives a little of the company, uh, sorry, of the trust. We're doing two major things. One is we are moving the location of the collection um, from where it was at Hampton Downs Racetrack, um, just a little south of Auckland in New Zealand. And we are going back to the original garage where dad was born and brought up. Oh. Where is that? So that's in Auckland, okay. in, in Remuera in Auckland. Mm -hmm. It's been bought, bought by a third party, but he is very much a Bruce fan. And that's the reason he bought the building. Mm. And he asked me to donate a few items to go into this um, facility that he was going to create. But once we took over as trustees, the conversation became, well, would the trust like to use the ground floor, the old original garage, to display their wow. collection. So we said absolutely yes. Yeah. So that's what's sort of that's amazing. in progress at the moment. We don't have a timeline for the that happening in that New Zealand is basically on a fault line and the same as, as the San Andreas fault that goes up through San Francisco. And so we are having to, well, the owner is having to seismically strengthen the building and make sure it is kind of safe. It's an old building. Um, so that is is not easy, mm. but we will go into there eventually, and we're not going to create a museum because that conjures up sort of a display of sort of dusty relics. We're not going to have a collection of objects sort mm. of in a case. We are going to tell a story. We're going to have the first part, which is sort of you walk into the garage, and, and this is kind of our vision for it how it was when dad was there. The outside of the garage would be how it was when dad was there and the first part of it. And that will be his formative years, developing that little Austin Ulster and then through to winning that scholarship. Second part will be early years at Cooper and then forming Bush McLaren Motor Racing through to his death. And then the third part will be racing and automotive. And the, the last part will have kind of a feel of MTC. Mm -hmm. So it'll be quite a different sort of walkthrough but it will tell a story, it will be engaging. And if you go in there because you've been taken by your partner or your spouse who is the motor racing fan, but you're not so, you will be inspired by the story of a young boy from New Zealand with a crippling disease, winning a scholarship and creating the company that is the McLaren Global brand today. So when it comes to dad winning a scholarship and kind of, his career developing off the back of being able to go to Europe. The trust is currently, we've created a scholarship for a young engineer 
from the University of Auckland to go to McLaren Racing for three months. Oh, wow. And we're going to do a similar thing for a driver. We're not quite sure how that driver scholarship is going to look because we're, we're still kind of talking to lots of people and, and we've got to kind of work that out. But that will sort of be the, the two big things that we will be doing in the future to continue the legacy and keep the trust moving forward into the future. Wow, that, what a, a brilliant move to preserve all that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we referenced it earlier, but for those who do go and see it, who know the racing history, I mean, the icons that have gone through the McLaren uh, racing program have just been unreal. And I know you were asked, besides your father, who would be the most iconic individual in the McLaren family, if you will. And you said Ayrton Senna. I did. Yeah. And there couldn't be a bigger I, name, honestly. I, I mean... And Bruno, by the way, you, also a brand ambassador. Bruno is, is, is just lovely. And, and his uncle Ayrton, what made him such a, a spectacular driver is something that you really can't pinpoint. Um, just, just you know, he says he, he sort of became one with the car and and... and influenced by God and just being able to drive the cars like he did, oh my goodness, and quite spectacular. So for me, he's he always has been and, and probably always will be um, McLaren's greatest driver, if not one of the greatest drivers in the history of, of, of right. motor racing. So, right. Yeah. yeah. And there have been a few who have gone through the McLaren system as well. They certainly have. They <laughs> certainly have. I mean, we, yeah. you know, we've had some amazing Formula One world champions, so Nicky Lauda and Alain Prost and Mika Harkonnen and Lewis, um, you know, he came up through the McLaren Young Driver program. And so, um, and, and, you know, Oscar and Lando out there, we're going to have another one shortly, I hope. Right. But, Let's talk yeah, a little bit about that. How, mm -hmm. What's your feeling about where the Formula One team is today? Whatever upgrades they've done, it just seems to be working superbly. Um, and, you know, we had a few rough years there. Let's be honest, it wasn't great for the team. Um, it, suddenly it's coming right. Mm. And we've got two of the most exciting young drivers, I think, and two of the quickest drivers on that circuit um, for each Formula One race every couple of weeks. And we're on the edge of our, our city, back in New Zealand, screaming at the telly again. <laughs> and, and, and that's just so exciting. Are you watching at one in the morning? The <laughs> no, we record it. Yeah. Um, I, I don't do one in the morning. I'm not, a, not an early morning person. So, and I can't look at social media and I can't look at my messages or anything right. until we've watched until the race. Watch the race. <laughs> so I make my cup of coffee and we get some breakfast and we sit and we watch it. And, and yeah, it's just, it's fantastic to see them doing mm. so well again. And, you know, yeah. It will happen because yeah, the team's just so engaged now and, and everybody's just working together really well and it's brilliant to see. You mentioned New Zealand. You chose to make New Zealand your home again. Mm. Why is that? And I know you were a nurse in New Zealand for a while. So, yeah, so yeah. I was born and brought up in England. Yeah. And my formative years there was schooling. Um, and I started training as a nurse mm. at Guy's Hospital in London. And my passion is horses. So I got kicked by a horse yeah, on one injured. of my weekends off, and mm -hmm. I was, it, my knee literally came apart. I had no ligaments left. It went 360 degrees oh. on the operating table. Oh. And after the, the surgery to repair, unfortunately, I got a, a, an infection inside the joint, which just didn't heal, and mm. it locked the whole joint solid. And I was on crutches for a year and having physio. And my mum and stepdad were coming out to New Zealand on one of their regular family holidays that, until really I'd started working, um, I'd go with them. So my mum said, come with us. Mm -hmm. So I got on the plane and went with them and we had our six weeks. And then I said to mum, I'm going to stay for six months. And six months became six years, became 26 years. <laughs> and anyone that's been to New Zealand will probably understand why I would kind of love it there. It's the most beautiful country, and the people are fantastic. And, and then I met and married my husband, Stephen, who was born in Auckland, just down the road from where my dad was. And so we set up home there. Mm. And then we got the call from Mike Fluitt, would you like to be brand ambassadors for McLaren Automotive? And so we kind of thought, mm, okay. So we packed up and went back to England, and we were there for eight years, and then COVID hit. And all our work was going to events and meeting people. 
mm. or escorting people through McLaren Technology Centre and telling the stories. And we couldn't do any of that. So I was able to ride my horse th throughout the lockdown. Mm -hmm. So I spent all day out in the, the moors and commons in England riding my horse. Stephen stuck at home. Mm. And so he starts doing his family tree and he has children and grandchildren. He started missing them more and more and we weren't quite sure what was going to happen with our roles, whether we'd able to be able to pick up work in a year or two years or five years of what was going to happen with the pandemic. So we decided that we would retire and move back to New Zealand and we gave Automotive a year's notice and we told Zach Brown what we were doing as well and they both said, okay, lovely for you, but for us, will you come back and still do some events in the future? And we said, absolutely, because as I said earlier, you know, I'll never not be dad's daughter. And so being asked to kind of come back to events like this and represent the, back, the brand are fantastic. But living in New Zealand is also wonderful. Mm. Um, and we've built a new house and we've just moved in um, and finally unpacked all the boxes and then repacked the suitcase and, and <laughs> uh, here, here we are now. But uh, yeah, you've got the best Zealand's of both worlds, don't you? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You've also been um, outspoken about certain issues, that uh, a couple of them that I'd like to touch on. One of them is online bullying. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a question that was asked of you recently uh, to have your take on what happened to Hannah Schmitz, who was the principal strategy engineer at Red Bull Racing mm -hmm. last year, who was a victim of, of mm -hmm. cyberbullying. You talk a little bit about your passion around making this, um, increasing the awareness around that. Okay, um, I mean, I think, you know, online bullying, cyber bullying, keyboard warriors, absolutely no excuse. It's so easy for people to do that because they don't have to pay, face the person mm -hmm. they're doing it to. And, you know, what is your reason for doing it? It's absolutely not okay. And so, yes, I was asked that question by, by um, a journalist who was interviewing me, and I said, you know, Anybody that does that, you know, somehow we need to be able to know who these people are and, and be able to just shut them down. Yeah. Shut down their, 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 their Facebook or their Twitter accounts or their Instagram accounts or their, it, it just isn't okay to, everybody's allowed an opinion, but if I disagree with you, we can do yeah. it politely. And I have no idea why you're doing what you're doing as a strategist. And you know, you see it on, on Zach Brown's, Facebook page and you sit on the McLaren page and they're slagging off what they did and, and it's You've like, been on the receiving end of it not, too. I've been on the receiving end of it and, and you know I've been able to because I kind of block these people and just mm -hmm. ignore them but you know it, it's not nice and certainly for some people it really does affect them and you know that their, their mental health is, is a, not good as a result and people can be so horrid to each other and, and I just they absolutely poor it. It's yeah. horrible. Really is. The other thing, women in motorsports, you've also mm. been outspoken that um, that there are opportunities that um, women should have, or, or uh, the, you know, the same chances to, to achieve in racing. Uh, mm. We've had a number of female drivers on the program here as well. Mm. What's your view on on that, and, and and just on the opportunity that can be presented to all genders? I think everybody should have an equal chance based not so much on gender but on ability. Mm -hmm. So I went to a very traditional all-girls school and never heard the word engineering throughout my education. Mm. Had I been a boy, those opportunities would have been there. And to me, that's wrong. You don't pick and choose because of gender. So if girls want to go and be an engineer, they should have the same opportunity as a boy that wants to go and be an engineer. And the same with a race driver. If you want to go race, and so, I mean, I'm really delighted that um, you know, McLaren have got into the Extreme E, mm -hmm. where you have to have a female driver. <laughs> so you, you, we, and we've got the lovely Emma Gilmore, who's a New Zealander, which is just that fantastic connection back to New Zealand again, and Dad. And she's a great ambassador for the brand too. But women now are getting the opportunity, which I think is, is so excited, and we've got specific programs to give women the chance to go and drive race cars and, and develop their skills, because for so long it was a male-dominated sport, and if you wanted to become a part of it, there were so many barriers and obstacles, mm -hmm. just because of, of the fact that you were female, which 
That's wrong. Mm -hmm. It really is. If you're as talented as the boy next to you, you get the same opportunity. Mm. So, yeah. Uh, 60 years and 13 years on the automotive side. The product proliferation on the McLaren side has been fantastic to see the various derivatives. And I think back to a conversation that we had on this program with Jay Leno, mm -hmm. who talked about his favorite vehicles that he has in his entire collection. And of course, focuses on the P1 as one of his favorites and tends to slag some of the other brands that he doesn't own, by the way. One other brand he doesn't <laughs> own. It's made for a very popular clip on this program. Uh, but, but he really praised McLaren and praised the innovation and, and the proliferation mm -hmm. of the brand. Yeah. Could you imagine, could your father have imagined where this brand is today in its 13th year of automotive, purely automotive existence? That's a really good question. And um, I would like to think yes. However, um, <laughs> I, I say yes because of his desire and ability to innovate and kind of try the new things. However, it's also the trajectory that automotive have taken is just so phenomenal. I think he probably would have taken a step back and said, wow, hmm. you know, how did you achieve that? Um, so yes and no is probably the I answer. I mean, he was all about innovation, so. He was definitely all about innovation, yeah. but you know, when like I look at, looked at P1 and, and I was fortunate enough to hear Frank Stephenson, who was head of the uh, well, director of design at that point. We've interviewed him on this program, yeah. And hear him kind of peel the layers off that car with the, the, the sailfish scales on the inside of the air intake. And then you hear about how they designed those, the, the, the struts on the rear wing and just the cutting edge innovation and technology that goes into those cars. It's just mind blowing, mm. and and just the cleverest people, and the product they create is just it's it's, it's all inspiring. It's jaw dropping. It's yeah, superlatives just aren't enough because they are amazing vehicles. And five years from now, what wow. what, what will we say? <sighs> I mean, you probably know, but <laughs> <laughs> I actually kind of try not to. Yeah because I want to be there. One of the most exciting things about sort of the job I was doing was kind of being around the, the, the journalists or the public at Geneva or somewhere and seeing the wrap come off that mm. car and hearing the <gasps> and seeing the reaction of people and, and standing next to Bianca Senna when they pulled the wrap off the, the, um, the Senna GTR at, at Geneva that day and just seeing 720S come out of this, this sort of dragon's cave with the smoke and its eyes and its nostrils. And yes. Just being a part of that. So yeah, we're gonna probably hear a little bit and see a little bit when we go back to MTC next month, but I also kind of just wanna wait and yeah. be wait, part of it when it really happens. happens. Right. Yeah. But whatever it is, I mean, yeah, if we continue doing what we're doing into the next five years, what we've achieved in the last five and 13, it's going to be incredible. Well, very what few, a journey. Very few people can see it, but you you showed me four years ago around the MTC and the evolution of the brand took me in that secret layer where customers go and pick up the cloth and the materials and everything else. It is um, truly out of James Bond uh, type stuff and that James Bond was all about innovation and all about um, things that you never saw on a vehicle and how appropriate that McLaren's continuing that yeah. tradition. And you're the best tour guide that I've ever had. So. Oh, well, thank you. I, mean, I thank really you appreciate so much. that. Thank, thank you thank for being you. on the program. My pleasure. Thank you to my guest today at Pebble Beach, Amanda McLaren, daughter of Bruce McLaren. And to see my interview with her, go to the Cars and Culture YouTube channel. Like and subscribe to see more than 115 interviews and nearly a thousand videos. And thanks for listening to the program. You can follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I'm Jason Stein. We'll see you down the road.